Hello, everybody, and welcome back to Only Stupid Answers. This is the show where we answer your questions about movies, TV shows, comic books. And today is going to be a very special comic book episode because we have an amazing guest. Ashley, say hi to the kids at home. Hi, kids at home. For those that don't know, who, who are you? Where can they find you? What are you up to? Oh, my goodness. If you were in Los Angeles, you probably just saw me at the Wallace Annenberg Center for the Performing Arts playing Medusa. Uh, which was really, really great Yay. and has taken over my entire life. Uh, but I'm also an award-losing comic book writer, an award-losing actor, and an award-losing podcast host who you may have seen all over the internet uh, with books like Jupiter Jet, Science, The Elements of Dark Energy, and Aurora and the Eagle, which I'm here to talk about today. Or you might have heard my podcast, Geek History Lesson. We just crossed 400 episodes oh recently. Oh. Uh, yeah, or I don't know, if you watch like urbanflix.tv, you saw me um, doing fake cocaine on television last year. So like that Yay. was fun. Yay, <laughs> fake fun. cocaine. What was it actually? Do you remember? Uh, so it was supposed to be powdered sugar, but it was actually granular cocaine. sugar. <laughs> oh. <laughs> so we had a really like nice sugar filled nosebleed for every Ooh. take after the first one. My Ooh. mother is so proud of me. <laughs> Yay. That sounds rough. Well, anyway, yes, we are going to be talking about Aurora and the Eagle. We're going to be talking about the uh, news today. We're going to be talking about Obi-Wan and we're also going to be talking about turning red. And with us as always is Roxy Stryer. Roxy, how are you doing today? I'm killing it, DJ. Just <laughs> slaying, you know. Just living I'm, the dream. That, that's always living the dream. Uh, yeah, I, that's what the kids say, right? I'm slaying. Mm -hmm. That's yeah. always uh, a good friend of mine. That's always our thing. Like, oh, living the dream. Um, yeah. <laughs> so uh, very exciting today. For the thank you everybody uh, for joining us, everybody that's listening in. If you want to watch episodes like this live, or if you want to hear um, Roxy and I talk about the stuff that we don't have time to talk about on the show with what we're into. Or you want to hear me and my pal Sal talk about Spider-Man movies, you can do that over at patreon.com slash onlystupidanswers. If you listen to this on iTunes, please give us a five-star review. It is uh, very beneficial. And if you listen to this on Spotify every week, we ask you a question. Last week's question is, who is your favorite actor to play Batman slash Bruce Wayne? Ray Raphael Alvarez said, Pattinson for sure. I love the Nolan trilogy, but if you really watch them, you see that Bale is kind of just there. I disagree with that, but we'll go on. Uh, his Bruce is too <laughs> smooth for a hermit. The villains usually steal the show. That's true of every Batman movie. Uh, Adrian yeah. uh, Adrian Michael Esparza, uh, Robat Bat and Pat, uh, was great and has all potential. My favorite is Batflick. He was a good Batman in bad movies. And Yeshu Wazalewski says, Christian Bale is my favorite Bruce Wayne. He has a uh, the suave attitude pattinson is in my opinion the best version of batman so those are all your all takes on that and not like the kevin conroy erasure how dare yeah i know it's it's dare. wild and it almost feels it almost feels unfair though because i ever i keep seeing these uh and i'm sure you all do too with the twitter all these tweets of like who did it best and it's like keaton uh affleck and Christian Bale and and Robert Pattinson and I always want to do that like reply with like the Kevin Conroy and it's like I can't do that for every one of these I can't be that guy for every one of these <laughs> but it's always it's it's and and we talked a little bit in the last episode too it's it's a little unfair because Kevin Conroy is a voice actor so mm -hmm. and we also got to spend more time with him has technically played him in live action in Crisis on Infinite Earths. Crisis on Infinite Earths. Yep, he is. He is. That is true. He is the live action one, and also like he, he not only did in like flashbacks did he get play younger Bruce Wayne, but in Batman Beyond he got to play older. He did all the Bruce Waynes. Yeah, yeah. Video yeah, games, yeah. like he, of course, he's the guy. <laughs> <laughs> um, so that's not what we're talking about today, Ashley. We want to talk to you a little bit about your comic that is on Kickstarter right now, Aurora and the Eagle. Uh, tell us about it, uh, starting with, where can the kids find it to go support? Okay, so here, look, we have visual aids. You can Ooh. find it at, this is my original piece of art from the postcard. Woo, Ooh. magic production. If you're value. watching the video, you get to see the, the postcard. Yeah, uh, Brian Lopez, who painted this for me, also sent it to me because he's foolish. <laughs> And uh, so you can find Aurora and the Eagle at auroraandtheeagle.com. It takes you right to the Kickstarter landing page because I'm not going to tell you to go to Kickstarter slash a bunch of numbers. I don't do math. That's mm -hmm. why I run Kickstarters instead of a publishing company. <laughs> <laughs> I, I don't do math. That's why I make comics. <laughs> Yeah, truly. Uh, I wrote this in the description of my campaign, but it's very true. And uh, DJ knows this intimately. 
Uh, you don't make comics to get rich. And if anyone believes oh, that, I have sure some don't. ice in Arizona to sell you. Mm-hmm. <laughs> oh, oh, boy, you sure don't. <laughs> that's why, like, a crowdfunding platform is so incredible. And that's it's the best thing, like, Patreon and Kickstarter. I'm going to die on this hill. Best thing happened to creatives in 20 years. Mm-hmm. <laughs> mm-hmm. we're gonna we're gonna see how all that uh blockchain mess turns out anyway uh, uh hasn't, hasn't been implemented <laughs> hasn't yet, been implemented so yet no yes not yeah, yeah, yeah. About it we're yet. not yeah that's not we're not worried about that <laughs> right now tomorrow problem <laughs> exactly i told i 100 percent agree so um what tell us about aurora and the eagle so aurora uh correct me if i'm getting this is is a canadian superhero that is a true and scientific fact. So fun <laughs> fact, in 2019 was when I debuted Aurora in the Eagle. I actually came on uh, OSA and I believe, I can't remember what version of the Collider Morning Show it was, <laughs> uh, but Roxy hosted at the time and was the only person who knew anything about immigration. And those are both key points because um, Aurora and the Eagle is a fantastical sort of exploration of my immigration journey from Canada to the United States. So it's designed to intersect like superhero identities um, and sort of where your allegiances lie. So Aurora Borealis, who it might shock you to learn, has the power of the Northern Lights. Oh, hell yeah. (laughs) Is That's just her government name, Mm -hmm. uh, is Canada's national superhero. And she gets tapped by the Unity League, which is like a global justice league on to be on probation for membership. So she comes to the United States to train with the Eagle, the mm-hmm. toughest, most badass American superhero. And also while she's training, they are simultaneously discovering and uncovering the truth of her predecessor's death. That was why she was tapped to join the league. When I did it in 2019, I did a 20 page digital only black and white version in order to raise the money to play my, pay my application for American citizenship. Cool. I'm now a citizen. I Hell am now yeah. a citizen. Congratulations. So, thank you. It was very expensive. Mm-hmm. <laughs> and, and also probably I'm going to guess time consuming. Yeah. It only took almost 11 years of my life. Cool. 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 Good, good, good. <laughs> And let's be very honest, like if we're going to, I'm going to wade into these waters. Uh, don't tweet me if you disagree. I'm a white person. So I had the easy, straightforward version mm-hmm. of what that process looks like. What would somebody's tweet response rebuting that look like? I don't know. Let's, I not, don't know. let's not even consider it. Let's <laughs> leave somebody, it a hypothetical. Somebody would rebuke me for saying uh, that. Like somebody uh, will. I'll send it to you. <laughs> so we can all have a laugh yes. about it. I don't want to um, be here anymore. <laughs> yeah, I know. <laughs> on this planet Mm -hmm. (laughs) and meeting leave me yeah um but the nice thing about that journey being done for me is now i can go and revisit it narratively just for fun Mm -hmm. um and whatever the opposite of profit is going to be so this campaign is the original 20 pages plus 28 additional new pages of story so it's a full 48 page prestige issue Hell yeah! and because we funded we funded in 24 hours which is so amazing it is now a pre-order campaign it is physical printed copies for the first time ever and we are like 120 dollars away from the first stretch goal which is fully colored pages and oh. if you go and look at the campaign you can see how beautiful the colored pages are um i was able to tap alivon ortiz who's an amazing colorist from mexico to lend her talents I wanted as many international peeps and as many women on the book as possible. So this 48 pages is the whole first arc. I've had this idea since I first came to the States. And I always knew that around page 50 and page 48 is really close to page 50. Mm -hmm. There was going to be a really big reveal about the eagle and the way he operates that was going to force Aurora to have to step up and like Dick Grayson graduate from being a sidekick to being a full-fledged superhero and i'm so excited to now finally be in a place amongst the global paper shortage where i can bring this story to people in its full and proper glory for the first time hell yeah that's super exciting and that's so close to your first stretch goal so everybody listening to this go to it's it's aurora and eagle.com that's true go, that's very go over true. there check it out go support it great stuff ashley does amazing work and it's interesting to me i think there's there's a little bit of serendipity today because we're going to be talking about turning red later which spoilers for those at home is very canadian it's very very clearly takes place in canada that's a big part of its story um and so i think this is a good opportunity to talk about canadian superheroes and i think something that that we don't think about a lot is that like uh, at least i would say at least two of the most popular superheroes in the entire planet are Canadian <laughs> mm-hmm. with Wolverine and Deadpool. So other than th- what, 
you being from Canada yourself, mm -hmm. um, what was it like to create your own original Canadian superhero? It's funny because creating superhero characters, it's kind of like using a D and D cheat sheet because you kind of know what type of hero you want them to be. I knew Aurora was going to be like a starfire Superman type so that she yeah. was going to have a lot of external powers. And the Eagle is much more like a Batman street level, like hyper intelligent character. Mm -hmm. But the trick for me became because she is a white presenting character because I'm white. So I didn't feel that it was accurate to if she was going to be so closely tied to who I am to like sort of step on anyone's toes. And mm -hmm. I wanted to see what was something that was like quintessentially Canadian, um, but also didn't feel like it was in any way, um, maybe like culturally insensitive. And so you sit there and you go, well, what do Americans know about Canadians? Because <laughs> <laughs> that's a huge part of my market. Uh, and a huge part of the Kickstarter economy is obviously based in the States and internationally. Yeah. Uh, and I know from running past campaigns that like a lot uh, domestic U.S. is going to be like a lot of things. So it was like, well, it's pretty much like maple syrup, Trudeau <laughs> and the Arctic. Right. Everyone yeah. thinks we live in igloos. So the Northern Lights was what came to me immediately as an idea. And it's just a really great visual. A-Force had, yeah. when A-Force was first announced, had a character who was just appeared as a star field. Mm -hmm. And I found that image on the cover like really, really evocative. And I wanted to do something similar to that. So when I landed on the Northern Lights, I was like, oh, great. I can just call her Aurora, which is like a very lazy character choice. <laughs> but she is very heavily inspired by Nelvana of the Northern Lights, which is a pre-World War II Canadian superhero character. Cool. Some people would consider her the first North American female superhero. Very cool. uh, and she she obviously has a lot to do with the Northern Lights and sort of Arctic culture uh, and the winter culture in Canada. And so her name is Nelvana. That is her superhero name. And I borrowed a lot of what I thought made her really neat and then molded it into who Aurora was. And then I also looked a lot at Alpha Flight because even though Alpha Flight is... Um, written by and worked on mostly by Americans and produced by an American company. I think it does a good job at capturing sort of Canadiana through mm -hmm. the eyes of superheroes. So I had some great inspiration when I was coming to build Aurora and then her, her persona when she's not like superhero Aurora is kind of like me at 19, which I like to generously think is me now, but like a little bit bitchier and a little bit whinier. Mm -hmm. <laughs> <laughs> which you get older, you get a little nicer, a little kinder. And then, you know, you cross 60 and you go the other way. Like, I was I'm just say, aiming... one hopes, one hopes. You can... yeah, yeah, yeah. Like my goal in future, you know, the gif of the witch from Snow White, where she's just like laughing and like lowering the trap door. Like yeah. that is the future I'm aiming for right mm -hmm. now. So we're in the oh, nice no. phase now. And then we're going to, we're yeah. going to land back there someday. <laughs> I think... Americans tend to know nothing about the world. Um, that's, that will be my nice way that I phrase that, but you kind of touched on the fact that you had to think about, okay, what is it that Americans will understand about Canada? Is there anything that you really wanted to put in here that you felt like represented Canada, but you were like, nope, they just will not get what I'm talking about. <laughs> so in my opening sequence, Aurora is based out of Ottawa, Ontario, Canada. And I did that very specifically because most people, Americans think that the capital of Canada is Toronto uh, <laughs> and it's not, it is Ottawa. And so I thought it was really important that she be based there and that we show the city and the city has really iconic images that a lot of Americans have seen when you see pictures of like Canada. Mm -hmm. um, so that was really important for me to include. And there is a line that says like Canada's capital city underneath it. And then um, the Eagles based out of the United States and out of Washington sort of in a similar reason. But yeah. there's little things like that that I wanted to include that I felt was important. And then I also gave because we're only in Canada for the first eight or 10 pages mm -hmm. um, until future issues. Ooh, uh, uh, but I also really wanted to have an indigenous um, prime minister and she is based on, she has a Métis last name um, and she's based on a couple reference photos that I found because uh, even though Canada is a very, uh, it's considered to be very nice and we're considered to be very progressive. We don't always have the best history with the uh, people whose land we invaded. So mm -hmm. I, it's like a really like weird, subtle thing. But I also wanted to sort of nod back to like Canada's mistakes as well. And in her universe, maybe we've righted them in a more 
uh, progressive way that is currently happening as Canada keeps digging up mass graves. <laughs> it, it just, yeah, yeah, yeah. The um, yeah, the, what, what are they called? The reservation schools, residential, residential schools. Residential yeah. schools. Yeah, yeah. Ooh, boy, uh, but also like uh, the the um, two of your points kind of like come together with like Americans don't know a lot about uh, the rest of the world, and like we also think Canada is nice, and then like the convoy happens, it's like, well, you know, they they have their own things, <laughs> you know. Yeah, they, yeah, yeah. Yeah. There's certain things, you know, there's certain things you just can't, we, we're just going to have to deal with as a culture. We can't just like run to Canada. <laughs> One of my favorite uh, Canadian actors is Paul Sun Young Lee, who uh, starred in Kim's Convenience, will star in Avatar, um, and has appeared in The Mandalorian. And he, in an interview, said, Canada's just better at hiding our badness. <laughs> and I think that that's like fairly accurate. <laughs> yeah. Wait, who is he playing uh, in the, the Last Airbender show? He's going to be playing Uncle Iroh. Oh, fuck yeah. That's cool. Yeah. yeah. That's good it's casting. Like the best casting yeah, that's good. ever. I, listen, <laughs> uh, I've got concerns about that show, but at least, so far the casting seems like, yeah, that you, yeah, at least that seems pretty cool. <laughs> Absolutely. And I think Daniel Day Kim is playing Fire Lord Ozai. Like, Great. Yes. Cool. And then, and then I think it's the, the young Shang-Chi from Shang-Chi is playing um, Zuko. And yes. I was like, yeah, all right. Yeah, yeah, yeah. That's cool. I like that. I'm into that. So b- before we're, we're going to go to ad break real quick. But Ashley, before we go, any final thoughts uh, that you want to share before we go to the ads about your comic? I would dearly love it if you would just come over and take a look at it because I think the art speaks for itself. We have the first five pages that you can read on the campaign and then five of the new pages that were added. Uh, one of the rewards that I really like to shout out is I've done script reviews for a long time. You can get script reviews from me. I'm the former head editor at Top Cow. I've done a lot of editor work, but I also this year added Kickstarter consultations to it because this is my sixth um, successful crowdfunding campaign. And like I mentioned, we funded in under 24 hours. And in the past, comics that we've given script reviews to for Jupiter Debt and Science have gone on to successfully become Kickstarter campaigns of their own. So even though this is my project that I'm asking you to come help fund, I consider everyone to be a member of Team Aurora. And I would like to help anybody make their crowdfunding dreams come true. Because like I said, this is one of the best things that's happened to creatives in years and more cool content from more cool people is just better for all of us. The more times we have to come to do podcasts and there's too much cool stuff to talk about is a blessing. So come check that out if you're a creative. Go, go We're on your out. site right now and it just looks freaking awesome. Thank this you. Is, it's wildly impressive. And also there will of course be links in the description. So go check yes, yes, all yes, yes, that yes. out. And now we're going to go to ads. Oh, my goodness. Be excited for ads. Yeah. Yeah, ads. Oh, we're back. And uh, we're going to be talking about, we're going to do a little bit of news right now. And, of course, the big thing, the 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 thing that uh, took over Twitter and the whole internet was we got a trailer for the uh, highly anticipated show, Obi-Wan Kenobi. Roxy, let's start with you because uh, I know you're a big Star Wars fan. <laughs> I do love Star look Wars. Look at that face. Yeah, look at that face. I don't. I, I'm going to be honest with you. I don't quite know how to read that face just yet. <laughs> here's, here's what happened. I was like up on my high horse, and I was like really mad at Disney, and I was like, I'm not going to watch this trailer. Mm-hmm. And then like every job that I have was like, Yes, you are, and I was like, Yes, I am. Mm-hmm. So I did, and this is the thing. It's like the trailer was effing awesome. This show is going to be great. I think I, I. I'm so excited for this. It feels like a kid on Christmas morning. Not that I would know because I'm a Jew, but like what I see (laughs) in movies, at least what it seems like. The way it's depicted, that general feeling. Yeah, yeah, yeah. (laughs) Yeah, that's how. This is this is my Christmas. Okay, (laughs) let the Jews take this one. Uh, And I'm just really excited. I'm really excited. I thought it was a very tight trailer, and I watched it, and I was like, "Man, you guys are so." good at what you do it, well, just, it was it was almost annoying to me yeah and to and just to address that before we move forward because we're also going to be talking about turning red which is pixar which is another disney thing so uh and, and uh ashley and roxy feel free to elaborate if i'm missing anything but but uh, uh long story short florida um is like a lot of these conservative states where they're just trying to uh triple down on transphobia and homophobia um and they've got this bill that is co- colloquially known as don't say gay it's bullshit uh, it's bad. And um, uh, Disney uh, financially backs a lot of the politicians that are supporting it. 
I imagine I haven't done this research, but I imagine because uh, Disney World is in Florida. So I imagine they have their fingers in the pockets of pretty much every politician in Florida so that they can do whatever the fuck they want with Disney World. Um, And people were asking them to uh, 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 to basically throw their clout around. And is it it's Chappick is in charge now? That's the guy. Mm hmm. He did this song and dance where he's kind of like, well, the content we do is going to be, that's how we're going to, whatever. And um, and now, as of this recording, uh, now that the bill has passed, he's like, actually, we never support it. And it's like, oh, cool. I mean, whatever. And it's, and it's frustrating for all the reasons that I just mentioned, but also just because it's like, this isn't. This is, it's not like Disney just became a problem. You know what I mean? Like well, this is, also, this is if just people if people think that that's not the exact reason that the trailer dropped, then they're very silly. Yeah, right. Exactly. Yeah, and it's, exactly. <laughs> yeah, and, it, and, it's and it yeah. was part of their like what was an investor day, whatever. Um, yeah. Uh, yeah. And, and this is just um, symptomatic of the just the problems that have always existed with Disney. Like this isn't like uh, uh, again as of this recording, I think it was just, just yesterday. A lot of Pixar uh, people on the Pixar team came out and been like hey we've been trying to do uh more inclusive stories for years and the disney yeah. executives like uh, uh grind that down to basically nothing um and, and so it's it's uh you know for people out there that are like you know i don't want to support the show i understand that sense i also know like it's it's not necessarily the faults of the people working on obi-wan or turning red no, or any of these not. things um uh the one thing i feel very confident in saying that you can do if you want um more inclusive stories and you want to support that is you can go to or and the eagle.com and support <laughs> ashley's comic yes. uh, I, i'm working on hellbent too so keep an mm-hmm. eye out for that uh uh you go support people that are doing those things uh and and you know whoever whatever anybody's stance is on on the obi-wans and the other stuff i mean you, you got to do what you, you think's right <laughs> Yeah, and yeah. go with your dollar. So, like, a really easy way to do that, for example, with stuff like Disney Plus, is um, share your accounts. Yeah, <laughs> yeah, completely. No. That and I would say, DJ. The bottom line is that they are the opposite of put your money where your mouth is. They mm-hmm. say one thing, and then their money goes completely into a different pocket. And yeah. So, I think it, it's just frustrating for us diehard Disney fans because, to be honest, when we're talking about content, I am a diehard Disney fan since I was three years old. Uh, oh gosh, does Disney give me all the feels? And I think probably you're listening to this podcast, at least a little sliver of you as a diehard Disney fan too. And very likely if you're listening to this, you're a diehard Star Wars fan. So it's hard because we have the conversation of separating the art from the artist, but this is separating the corporation from the corporate and and the art. And it's just, I, I find it <laughs> challenging to do, but boy, do they know how to make a fucking product. And I ate it up. Yeah, so and it's just did. a big it's just yeah. a big whole tangle because it's like that's more of the the business end and who knows what the creative people are trying to do. Yeah. Right. And all of us are trying to be creative. So at some point, if we actually do want to make money doing things, it's going to be coming from one of these people. And it's not like uh, uh, the the um, uh, Disney is bad, but also Warner Brothers is bad, and also you know what I mean. Like the <laughs> big corporations. Yeah are bad they're just bad <laughs> so like I, I, I yeah I, but i still cut off my arm to work for disney the answer is yes you know what i mean and it's yes. like it's it, it's, ki- it's just want. kind of like the yeah. the just generally if for those that have missed out on the past general two years or our entire lives shit's kind of fucked so uh yeah. Yeah, and if you're coming to this podcast for the i mean it is only stupid answers if you're coming for good answers <laughs> i don't know what to tell you um we're Just all... do what's do what's right for you ultimately, and don't like rain on anybody else's parade because of it. Because we're you... all just trying to do our best. Exactly. Yeah. I think that's the thing is we're all we're all trying to figure out the best thing to do, hopefully mm-hmm. together. Um, and and uh, my hope is that somehow we will stumble into a uh, not just a good uh, uh, um, conclusion, but one that we can execute in any sort of way. <laughs> uh, yeah. Anyway, <laughs> so that's that, and it's not just there was no way it, there's no way we could talk about these things without mentioning that. Um. So, uh, Ashley, going on to you, uh, mm-hmm. did you get a chance to see the trailer? I did. Yeah. Do, I did, what, I did. What, what are your thoughts? I think uh, Ewan McGregor is aging way too gracefully to be playing somebody who's going to look like Alec Guinness looked in uh, <laughs> A New Hope in the next, I don't know, six years. Yeah. Because this is supposed to be 10. Luke is 10 and he's 16 when Mark Hamill played him at, I think, 26. Mm-hmm. Uh, magic yeah. movies. Uh, so I guess it's like a rough six years on Jack to me. He's living in a cave, though. So maybe, maybe that's it. Um, 
ever since I learned what the volume is, I feel like more and more I can see the volume uh, in every Marvel thing. I definitely think you can see it here, but it is pretty beautiful. I mean, when you have more money than God to throw at something, Mm -hmm. you better put out a damn beautiful trailer. I thought considering he's a strange old hermit who lives on Tatooine, we have seen an awful lot of not Tatooine Mm -hmm. in this trailer and in the EW photos that also came out to accompany this. But I am like a diehard Rebels fan. So seeing the Inquisitors, uh, I don't have any like negative opinion about how the Grand Inquisitor looks. I don't know how folks expected a dude in a rubber. Like I'm a a Trekkie. Mm -hmm. So there's like... There's no consistency in what aliens look like as far as I'm concerned. Yeah. Uh, beards one day, headbands, foreheads, whatever. I think I think the Great Inquisitor looks cool. And I think he's a really cool character that's going to be fun to see in live action. But I do think it's very interesting how we are now far enough away from the prequels that folks are OK being like, I don't know, like I kind of liked it. Mm-hmm. I kind of thought like Bonnie and Joel were like a really good like casting choice. So we'll just, we'll just bring them back. Like this is like, were you nine when episode one came out? We have a show for you. You're going to love it. <laughs> well, and I also like the, the, we need to be careful because Roxy, I, I believe Roxy's a big prequel fan. <laughs> I'm not, I'm not, I'm not, I don't to mean to always was. Was. ever make fun or anything. Like there's but always was. Like, yeah. the prequels. But, but always I do, was. I I'm do. not a, I'm not a bag, uh, bandwagon fan. I, I've always been a prequel uh, supporter. When, but, when uh, I was a, when I was a child, I carried a Jar Jar Binks action figure in my purse. Like I, uh, there's, there's no prequel hate. Yeah. <laughs> but, Jar Jar didn't age as well as I was, uh, as my young self thought that he might. Yeah, 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 yeah. yeah. <laughs> yeah. But, but I do, I do like how this is very strategic. Of like, okay, prequels. Everybody liked the one McGregor. He's back. Duel of the Fates, bringing that back. Uh, yeah, you know yeah, what yeah, I mean? yeah. It's very like, Amy hey, Christensen, we like him now. He can come back. Too. Sure. Yeah. I like. I, there was a <laughs> shot of like, and it, it look it, honestly, the the this still looks like it could be from Empire, but it's like King Christensen is Darth Vader. I'm like, that's that could be anybody in that goddamn suit. Like, why are you trying it's, to convince him? It is absolutely like I will die on this hill. That is not Pedro Pascal in that armor. No, uh, no, it's it's uh, the same like, thing they do with Doom Patrol. At least Doom Patrol yes, doesn't exactly. pretend. Doom Patrol's not pretending like. It, no, Doom Patrol's like fully crediting those two actors. Yes. Who are also great actors and were great when they appeared in Fear Street. Yeah. Um, but but like, the, yes, Hayden Christian showed up on set for like the opening and closing day so that he could get his little round of applause and the picture to it, whatever. And then for like the one sequence where we're going to see the helmet slip back yeah, on. Yeah, like, yeah. It's, it's a nice guy in Toronto. It's probably someone I went to theater school with. <laughs> um, so we've got a, a couple questions here. We've got um, um, uh, Jake Hefner. What do you hope to see in Kenobi that we haven't seen in other Star Wars shows? What Star Wars show would you like to see that we haven't seen yet? So let's let's focus on that first part. Um, Ashley, you mentioned even though <laughs> – I mean, fans of this show will know the reference, but it, it reminds me of like an arrow where it's like Oliver's been on this island for five years, and then around yeah. season four, they're like, uh, he left. Uh, or no, I think it's season three. And so it's the same thing. Obi Wan was just on Tatooine the whole time, and then the show's like, ah, we're not going to do that. Uh, so. <laughs> So beyond the fact that we're going to a new planet, what's some stuff that we would like to see that maybe we haven't seen in Star Wars shows before? Ooh, that we haven't seen in Star Wars shows before. That's a tough question because there's now 187 Mm -hmm. Star Trek shows, I feel like. Um, I would like to see someone who's not a Skywalker (laughs) lead an entire episode by themselves. I'm just kidding. I'm just being facetious. Um, I think I would like to actually see a little more of what it is like to be a solo Jedi practitioner because Mm -hmm. we've seen Yoda. We've seen where Obi-Wan is at the beginning of A New Hope. And we've seen who Luke becomes over his journey on on those three movies, but there's a lot of like beta canon and legends that tie into what Obi-Wan does when he's alone in his hut, which apparently hasn't been built yet. Mm -hmm. Apparently gets real grimy over those six years, Mm -hmm. but I would like to see how he maintains and evolves the Jedi tradition. Like that's the stuff that I think is really, really interesting. It's why I was like very into the idea of gray Jedis and what the sequel trilogy, I think, was trying. I don't think it, 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 it succeeded in that, but what it was trying to tell us about the evolution of the Jedi, that is something that like, I would just love like sequences of sitting in Obi-Wan is meditating and he is journaling and he is questioning and he is evolving. But I think that is like 
I think I want like the Better Call Saul version of this show. Mm -hmm. And there's going to be like William Shatner is going to punch someone. This is going to be like another cowboy show because all the Star Wars live action shows are just Westerns with the original material scraped off. Yeah, yeah, yeah. (laughs) It's oh, man. Um, That'd be really interesting. Although you did, you know, mention like we saw Yoda. I'm like, shit. Yoda's going to be in the sh- show. There's going to be an episode. He's going to go to fucking Dagobah to be like, Yoda, what do I, what should I do about this? <laughs> or they'll have a psychic force. Oh, Zoom yeah, yeah. You know I mean? Are you mad at that? You're mad at the episode in which he goes and sees Yoda? <sighs> I mean, if, 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 if Frank Oz isn't there a little bit, I, we've seen a lot of Yoda recently and yeah. Star Wars does love to dip in the same well for a long time. And also I'm just going to say, like, I think as a kid, I really liked the concept of the Jedi and now we've spent decades and hours and th- we just haven't really done anything creatively to like flesh out like what the Jedi believe or why, or mm-hmm. like, it's just such, it's such a, it's still such a vague archetype. Like I've said, I see that, I say this every time we do Star Wars stuff, but it's like George Luke is very specifically built a world around archetypes. And then the past decades have done nothing to like evolve it past that, mm-hmm. at least as far as like the, the main movies or whatever. So I, I'm not mad at Roxy. I just like, uh, I don't need it. It's the same thing. Like I, I didn't like it when Yoda showed up in, in Last Jedi. I just didn't like, like, come on. Like, you can't you can't build this whole movie around the idea of, like, we need to do new things. But also, here's Yoda. Um, anyway, Roxy. Why can't you do Jay? We, you can't. Listen, you can't. I, this is why when we did our Star Wars episode, it's like, li- I, I've watched all the movies. I've watched a good chunk of the shows. But I don't I consider myself a Star Wars fan because it feels like everything that interests me, Star Wars fans are like, well, that's not really Star Wars. So it's like, all right, whatever then. Um, well, I'm the problem. <laughs> I'm, I, I acknowledge that I'm the problem because what they do is feed me. And I'm the person out there who's like, I love a pop in with Yoda. I love a, I love a whole episode where we steer away from everything that we're talking about just so we can see a DH Luke come <laughs> so into it. Like, I, I don't know I don't know why I feel so much more attached to the characters than I do to the land. Yeah. And it's been that way for a long time with me for Star Wars. So I feel so much more attached to any poppins we're doing than any planets we go to or exploration that we do. Uh, and so I know that I'm the problem because that it's me that they're feeding with with all of their CG and all of their their <laughs> poppins. But at, at the same time, maybe that's because that's what they've fed me that I'm excited about that stuff. And I would be interested if I could get excited more about where we are. I think it'd be really nice to have a show that focuses on its titular character, mm-hmm. uh, which it would be very different than the last show that we just <laughs> saw that decided halfway through. We're gonna be Mandalorian season two. This yeah, not it would be it would be hilarious around like episode four. Mando rolls up and like, wait, how old are you even at this point? <laughs> yeah, yeah. So oh, mark my words, he will be in that show somewhere, even like if a, it's just a name drop. Flash forward, or like, or like mm-hmm. we see like from the, the when the machines were attacking the Jedi that saves him is Obi Wan. <laughs> Yeah, exactly. <laughs> yeah, I'm I'm with you. Low key, I think they're gonna figure out some way to shoehorn everybody that they ever want in. But at least Baby Yoda, because he's been he's been kicking around 500 years. No, 50 50 years prior 50 to years, 50 yeah. 500 years. Oh my god, 500 yeah. years. I added an extra zero Yoda. in there. Like, well, how much there. more baby could he have been? Good question. Like a little- <laughs> Little thumb, just little like thumb this big, yeah. yeah. <laughs> oh, that's like what they. Do. Oh my god, are we gonna see like a little Groot situation? Uh, like baby or Yoda, <laughs> even more baby Yoda. Baby or Yoda. Yoda. <laughs> baby or Yoda. We've got another. Thank you. Uh, we got another question here from Danny. Um, um, since we're all creators, when it comes to Kenobi, how do we make an interesting story when we already know the before and the after? How can we add stakes to a show like Kenobi? So. Um, uh, we've all written things. We've all, we've all, you know, we talk about these shows and it can be tough since we know where Kenobi starting and we know where it ends. Uh, but I would also say you actually you mentioned better call Saul earlier. It's mm-hmm. like, well, that, uh, did a really good job with that. Mm-hmm. <laughs> yeah. It's, it's so easy in my, my opinion, but it's the same conundrum that I have, um, with the Lord of the Rings animated series, uh, like Lord of the Rings is my favorite fictional thing. Mm-hmm. I'm very invested in it. What do you do if Elendil and Isildur is alive? Then we're like a hundred or so years from the War of the Ring, and like we know what happens there. 
And then we know that Frodo is the Jesus figure who saves the world. Yeah, like, yeah. so the way that you make it compelling is what exactly what Better Call Saul did is you go into the character and the emotionality. A Star Wars example of that is, remember when Marvel said we're doing a Darth Vader series and we were all like, literally, why? Mm-hmm. Like, what? And it turned out to be one of the best Marvel comics, like not even just Marvel, Star Wars comics. And I think about this panel, it like lives rent free in my brain. There's a page where he learns that Luke is alive, that his name is Luke Skywalker. And it's just three, it's a, it's a three page panel and it's him look, it's Darth Vader looking out in space and it it's just him, it's back. And then it pushes in a little bit and then it pushes in a little bit more and the glass is cracked mm-hmm. because that's how much emotion he's feeling. There's no words. Yeah. But you feel that and it's such an amazing moment and it's so iconic to the Star Wars comic book canon now and that fandom specifically because now we've learned that Darth Vader actually cared Mm -hmm. before the reveal at the end of the third movie. And like that's what this series has to do in order to matter at all. Um, otherwise, and we've seen this, we've seen this across genre. We've seen DC do this, we've seen Marvel do this. Otherwise, it's just it feels like a fan film. It feels like a mashup that you would see anybody make with iMovie on YouTube. But I think because they have some really, really talented actors, and I think because Kenobi is a show that people have been screaming about, I mean, for our entire lives, certainly. Mm-hmm. I think this might be the show that actually cracks that, starring some of the most recognizable characters that we have from the franchise, or certainly thus far. Yeah. What yeah. about you, Roxy? What do you think? I- I completely agree with everything that Ashley just said, but also on top of all of that, I think that take it outside of the comic book genre for a second. Mm -hmm. We have uh, docu-series all the time, but where we know exactly what's going to happen. You know, I'm watching The Dropout, which is the Elizabeth Holmes show uh, on Theranos, and I know what happens. Mm -hmm. I I know that she claimed that she invented a product that didn't actually exist and that that's not going to be invented and that she's going to lose her company and get arrested. I know that. And I'm still watching every single week. Like what the is going on? Because it's about the moments. It's about the dialogue. It's about the, the, the relationships. It's not about where do we start and where do we end? It's about the in-between. And I think that that's the same for any kind of show. It doesn't have to be a comic book show or a Star Wars show. It just needs to realize that if you have a beginning and an end, you're in a box. And being in a box creatively is kind of actually a really fun place to be. It's why there are things like writing prompts, right? Where it's not just like, do anything you want. It's a little too big for some people. It's a little too, what's anything? So if you say, here's where you start and here's where you finish. And we know a couple things in between now play. I actually think that's a really beautiful place to be as a creator. I, I like those kind of things. And, and I hope that Star Wars realizes that that gives them more room to play and not less. Uh, totally agree. And I think kind of what we're touching on is something I, I've mentioned before as well is this idea that, and I think a lot of blockbuster properties struggle with this, is plot is not story. Your mm-hmm. plot is not your story. Your plot is the vehicle to tell the story you're trying to tell. So the the and and, and hopefully it's not just like well we have Ewan McGregor and people want an Obi Wan show. So I guess here it is. Hopefully there's actually like a story that we can tell with this character. Um, and before we go to ad break, Danny followed up and he said also since we heard Duel of the Fates in the trailer. Could we see a mall cameo and would you like that? And I think, um, Ashley, you just said you were a big Rebels fan. And while mm-hmm. I haven't seen all the episodes, I do. We resolved the Obi Wan mall yeah. thing in an episode. And so I'm curious your thoughts on that because I, I listen, I know Disney's like all these shows are canon, the comics are canon, but it still feels like what it used to be in this in back in the day where it's like it's canon until one of the live action things wants to do something with it. And then. <laughs> Absolutely. As long as he has spider legs, then I'm here for it. Yeah. And also, again, <laughs> listen, for again, I didn't watch all I think I did not watch I know I've watched a couple episodes with the Rebels. Um Maul was dope. I it, you know, the things you pull from the prequels, one of the things I do remember fondly from the prequels is Maul's fucking sick. I watched a few of the episodes <laughs> where he came back in Clone Wars because Maul was back. So it's like, yeah, listen. I do it. I don't fight. I, you know what I mean? Don't step on rebels toes. I respect that fandom. I don't want you to piss them off, but also like, Hey man, fucking it'd be cool. <laughs> just do it. Just, just do it a little bit more organically than you did Cad Bane in Boba Fett. I love Cad Bane. <laughs> loved him in Boba Fett, but it, it was just, it, 
<laughs> felt like you figured it out like two episodes. Oh, like maybe we should do Cad Bane now. Anyway, that's that. We're going to go to another ad break and we will be back to talk about turning red. We're so back. Fun. Yeah, it's so back. Hey, guys, oh, we're good. We're, we're back, here. everybody. If you, We <laughs> missed out a fun conversation if you weren't watching live. Um, but now we're going to talk about um, Turning Red, which is the latest Pixar film. It is, it is now on Disney+. Plus. Um, it was directed by Domi Shi and written by Sarah Streaker. Hopefully I pronounced that correct. Julia Cho and, of course, Domi Shi. Domi Shi, excuse me. And it is about a 13-year-old girl named Mei Lee uh, who turns into a giant red panda whenever she gets too excited. Um, and and yet and yes, it is it is the it is a Pixar version of the Hulk story. It is a very adorable Pixar version of like a Hulk situation. Um, and on uh, as of this recording on Rotten Tomatoes, it has a 95%. And the critics say it's heartwarming, humorous, beautifully animated, and culturally expansive. Turning red extends Pixar long extends Pixar's long list of family friendly triumphs uh and i am very excited to talk about this because i really enjoyed this movie i i um uh i'm a big pixar fan um and i think uh, like it like it said in that little description i think it takes what what pixar does really well which is these heartwarming um character-centric stories that are beautifully animated but also um, broadens the animation storytelling sense. Um, uh, you know, there's a lot of Western tradition in there, but there's a lot of stuff that uh, that I would traditionally associate with with anime or more Eastern um, influenced animation. And it was really cool to see that uh, incorporated into the kind of traditional Pixar style because uh, it, it allowed this movie to do to move in ways that other Pixar's uh, Pixar movies haven't, and that's always really cool to see. I like I like it when the the Pixar animators like in Soul we got to see their version of the Afterlife, or Inside Out we got to see the in, internal their their depiction of how our brains work. And so this is this is a, a she does turn into pa- giant panda, but it is a comparatively more grounded story. But that that animation style uh, made it really really lively and interesting. What did you all think of Turning Red? I find it really interesting that that the internet. Sorry, I just started talking. No, yeah, well, go for I it. You guests first. <laughs> I find it interesting that the internet is is uh, like DJ calling this a Hulk metaphor, and I go, ah, men. Well, because no, it is. It is. This is a thirteen-year-old girl is turning a red. Of age. This period, is a metaphor. period metaphor. <laughs> Let's go. Let's go. <laughs> and uh, I'm a. I, I'm assuming this takes place around like 2002. I don't know if they timestamp it, but like. I'm a little bit younger than May was if she was 13 um, around yeah. the beginning of the early aughts. But like, man, like I, I didn't live in Toronto, but I lived like in little towns, kind of a couple hours outside of Toronto. So like May and her friends and their level of obsession with the boy band and the flip phones and the Tamagotchi, like that was like me and my best friend Lisa growing up. Like I like immediately, I was like, I am in on this. I like that we're doing like, the sort of, uh, to quote the great Britney Spears, not a girl, not yet a woman journey. And I'm glad that we're getting to explore that without making it like, and now it's a horror movie and they're going to kill everyone Mm -hmm. because blood and blood and blood and guts. Like I thought it was a really like genuinely cute and sweet way to play that out while exploring uh, like some cultural diversity. I'm not going to pretend that I have any kind of familiarity uh, besides a passing one at best with like May's culture, but it did feel authentically done. And I think that's because Domi, she was at the head of this. Yeah. Uh, if anyone didn't see Bao, that was her short as well. Yeah, which um, was in front of Incredibles 2, I think, but it's also on Disney+. Plus. Yes, and I'm sure is what springboarded her to getting this movie in the first place. I will yeah. say some of my favorite aspects of it narratively was... I guess this is a spoiler. Yeah. Um, I'll try not to spoil everything, but toward the light end. Spoil- it's already out, but light spoilers. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. Um, but toward the end of the film, when we get into sort of the more mystical nature and the familial line, and we get a look at all of the matrilineal family members when they were 13, and you mm-hmm. kind of get to see look everyone looks like a monster at 13 it's just the way development goes <laughs> um it was cute to see all of those characters connecting on this very personal human level through this magical anthropomorphic kind of device and mm-hmm. i would have liked to see a little bit of that sprinkled a little more heavily throughout the narrative like that was my main 
takeaway from it was I was like, more magic, please. <laughs> more magic, less dancing. And the dancing is still is still pretty cute. And, and I was like, man, remember elementary school? That was a fun, fun time. Uh, I, I think a lot of the people who are being critical of it, a lot of what I'm seeing, and you can be critical without being disrespectful, but a lot yeah. of the discourse kind of stretches that way because they think the narrative is, quote, too specific. That's such um, a wild... As if, as, as if E.T. wasn't too specific well and even beyond any, that like like, like I, I, a point of view yeah that's a that's kind of a ridiculous complaint anyway but also yeah. part of what make i guess at least for me stories pop is or, or at least what allows uh i think people to invest in a story is the specificity of it is the is mm -hmm. the the more specific you can get which kind of like loops into some of my critiques with star wars but anyway the the more specific you can get with the story the more invested you can get it as an audience member and that's not uh, you know obviously i think that that helps with specific like like uh something I, you were mentioning ashley that i really liked about this movie is, is the the tamagotchi and the stuff it's like oh this is a, yeah. this is a very specific time and place beyond that even in a fantasy setting even in something like like a sci-fi or fantasy the more specifically detailed you can you can create the world the easier it is to buy like okay there are rules i understand like how people function in this reality i'm able to invest into that so it feels like a very uh bad faith argument to be like oh it's too specific it's like what the fuck are you even talking about like what do you mean it's too like oh it's actually takes place in a time and a place like what do you what do you fucking mean anyway i've seen i've seen people respond with was black panther too specific like yeah it, 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 and i'm sure for some crazy. people it was <laughs> yeah this is a uh, what is crazy about this though i think that this is uh, is fascinating because i'm sure that you guys are in a similar boat when i used to when i was growing up and i would see different critics complaints about things i have no idea who these people are they, i don't know who they are yeah and you know when you see that sean from cinema blend who was the main one who wrote uh yeah. this i'm like well oh, this guy and i follow each other on twitter this is so weird he, like we're in a connected circle then you see like a huge response from like lon harris responding being like this is a stupid take or whatever yeah. it is i'm like that's my friend lon go get him <laughs> like just sitting there and feeling like i was like this is a bizarre place to be because I, I know that these people are people and they don't speak perfectly sometimes. And he has come out and apologized and said that he, that he didn't explain himself. Well, that being said, I think he probably explained himself exactly how he meant. Um, I don't know. I don't know him well, but I think that anybody who looks at this movie and their first thought is this movie isn't for me because it's only for a very specific group of people. It's like, okay, so you're talking about, Asian people, women, and Canadians? Are those, uh, is that the specific group? And then like wherever the uh, the diagram meets of all three, that mm -hmm. intersection, is that is that what you're deeming this to be for as opposed to every other story in the world that isn't about what somebody looks like um, if they don't look like you that you've liked anyway? So I thought the criticism was su super bizarre. Uh, and, and like we've been living in a pandemic for a long time, so people forget to check in like hey is this a good thing to tweet and so, <laughs> yeah, somebody yeah, in his yeah. life should have been like no dude that is not a good thing to tweet why would you tweet that that doesn't even make sense that being said i really enjoyed this movie i thought it was a really cute movie like ashley i just was so stoked about the girl squad aspect of this because it just reminded me of my life and it, it my very clearly my very specific life uh, <laughs> I, I just felt like I was I was thinking about this, you know, we just had our most recent movies from Pixar were Luca, Soul, Onward, Toy Story 4. Yeah. Those are our four most recent. Incredibles 2. Those are our five most recent movies. And definitely none of those had the aspect that this did, which is like Girl Squad. Yeah. And most of those movies are very male dominated and also great and also have you know other than being male dominated they're like souls and stuff so <laughs> it's got a lot of different things going on but this is this was the first time in years that we've really had a female dominated pixar movie and one that i connected to so bad it was just so great to see these these girls support each other mm -hmm. and they wanted to be there for each other and they're not bitchy 13 year olds you know in moments but they are 13 year olds who are navigating life and they're navigating this coming of age moment together. And I thought that was a really beautiful, endearing lesson. 
uh, and also looked awesome. And I also was obsessed with boy bands and my Tamagotchi. So for all of those reasons, I was just like, oh, cool, this movie is for me. And then to go to the internet and have them be like, well, it's only for a very specific person. It kind of felt like that's such a bummer that pe- that sp- somebody can't appreciate that. I did feel very lucky to get this movie. And um, I was really happy to have it. And I thought it was very good. Yeah. Do you think it was a little bit of a disservice to this movie that it came out in the same year as Encanto uh, or in the same one year period only because uh, generational trauma being kind of the villain of the story is something that we just saw in another animated movie. And I felt like that was a really, that would have hit me more powerfully in this if I hadn't just seen that. And with, you know, the, the uh, grandma relationship, mother relationship, but oh. still it was very, very strong and powerful. And I was happy about it. I think you can tell that Pixar and Disney animation don't speak to each other because yes. <laughs> uh, uh, Luca and Encanto both had pivotal characters reference named Bruno. Mm-hmm. Right. And, and then Encanto and Turning Red have this sort of overarching matrilineal like traumatic theme going through the family line. And it's like, you don't even have like one exec who could have been like, Hmm, maybe yeah. we push it one more quarter. Like. Yeah, exactly, exactly. But it's whatever, you know, yeah. that doesn't affect how it's going to age. And so Absolutely. Yeah. I think I, it's going to age very well. I also did like in the movie where, you know, with so so we, you know, this girl turns into a red panda. This is part of this this generational thing. And I did like how we talked about, oh yeah, mom, your mom's just kind of a problem. And then when we elaborate on that le- later, it's like, oh yeah, mom was a problem. <laughs> it's, this, this is something that needs to be resolved. Uh, but yeah, and I also think it's it's strange that like not only not only do it uh, allow that like Roxy that somebody like you could enjoy it, but also to allow themselves to enjoy it. Because I think part of story is being able, in, in, some, in some cases, it's to see parts of yourself reflected back, which which I also grew up with friends. So I also liked that her friends were supportive. <laughs> yeah, I know. It's, yeah, we may have expressed it differently, but the, the broad strokes are pretty similar. Uh, and, and also, um, uh, but that idea to be, to like, like I didn't grow up in Canada. I'm a white guy. I have a pretty chill relationship with my parent. Like we're, we're pretty fucking cool. Uh, <laughs> but to be taken to that place and see, because I, I think the beauty of storytelling in movies is the ability to communicate with people almost across time and space. So in that, in watching that movie in this kind of heightened scenario, I'm able to get a window into what I would assume is either uh, 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 Domishi growing up or, or Friends of Horror or some amalgamation of that. And that's, there's a real beauty in that. Now, now, now suddenly I'm, I'm allowed to, to have hopefully maybe a deeper understanding of what other people went through. And that's kind of, that's something storytelling and movies and video games and comics can do that almost nothing else can. So like embrace that. Like, I don't know <laughs> again, whatever. I like the movie. Um, but going off of um, something you were talking about, how maybe being so close to Encanto was a disservice. Uh, we do have a question here from Leonard Kim about um, after watching turning red, has your opinion changed on Disney's decision to send it straight to Disney plus good move or bad move and i connect no, that to send everything to streaming uh, well it's 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 a i i agree with that in the fact that it's uh, keep people safe but 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 to to, to I, when the panini's over i don't want to go back to movie theaters i'd have seen batman by this point if i didn't have to leave my house but but like um uh, it i agree if it is everything by by sending some things to disney plus and some things to yes. see it feels like you're making a value judgment hierarchy yeah and Absolutely. i'm bummed that it's like a lot of the Pixar movies that's been ha- that's been happening with, and it's like, but and they're and like specifically with this one, it's like they're doing good things, and so it's like I wish it would have been cool. I glad that I didn't have to go to the theater, mm-hmm. but I would have, and I would have really enjoyed Me this too. in the theater. <laughs> well, just to pile on to the Disney is evil argument a little bit, um, it uh, <laughs> it lets you know what they value. Yeah. And it lets you know what they don't value as much, um, which perhaps is a bad faith argument because it was made in the first place. But uh, you won't see a Star War going only to Disney Plus, certainly not for free, maybe for that. Uh, what was Black Widow at? Like thirty nine ninety nine? Yeah, oh, the, the nine. premiere yeah. or whatever it was. Yeah. Yeah. Like that's, you know, I'm very much of like, put it all on streaming and charge me to watch it if I want to watch it in the first like quarter or something like that. Like yeah. I... I would love that for the rest of my life, honestly. <laughs> well, 
I wonder what you guys think. Genuine, genuine question. Do you remember as a kid, you're watching movies in the theater as much as you remember watching them on VHS at home? Ooh, interesting. Uh, I think for me, it kind of blurs together uh, in that, like, I could swear to you that I saw, like, Batman 89 in theaters, and I would have been three. So there's no fucking way that that was the case. Um, <laughs> uh, and also, I remember there's, um, hopefully they're fixing this soon, knock on wood, there's a, there's a song taken out of Muppet Christmas Carol that is like actually mm-hmm. like pivotal to the movie and and it's and, and my wife had never seen it and so we were watching it and when the scene just goes from one thing past the song to the next thing I was like wait time out hold on <laughs> I, and what I found out later and I remember seeing that in theaters that's how I remember it but what I found out is that song was actually originally cut for the theatrical version and it was re-added on VHS so what I'm remembering is what I saw at home um, so I don't know how that pertains to your question because it kind of like blends together in my brain (laughs) yeah yeah i think of going to the movie theaters as a child as being like for a holiday or a birthday party or something like that Mm -hmm. i remember i remember the same thing i remember like the experiences of going but i don't really usually remember what i was watching Mm -hmm. and so i think if our concern about putting things on streaming is that like the kids won't get the same experience actually don't know that that's true. I haven't been a kid in a while, but I feel like (laughs) I was just as excited to make microwave popcorn and sit in front of my like legitimately, I think like 10 inch screen (laughs) um, and put the VHS in and watch. I remember that that's how I watched Titanic for the first time. And I sat there and put Titanic, I had two different VHSs Mm -hmm. and I put one in, I had popcorn. I sat maybe like three inches away. Uh, And I, (laughs) and so I, I don't know if I am with DJ that when you're putting some and not all, it does feel icky and a little hierarchy, but I don't think, I think if we could do what Ashley's saying, where we just put all of them on streaming, I don't think that that would make the experience worse for kids mm-hmm. or or make it less memorable or make it less poignant i think that that's not really how kids view things i'm not a psych i i, I don't have the authority to say that but that's my belief based on being a kid yeah. i also think we very much overestimate how great it is to go to the movies um because in los angeles you're paying for two people almost 50 if not 50 dollars. if you're going to imax you're certainly paying over 50 dollars for your ticket you're paying uh usually around five to ten dollars to park depending on where you're going you're paying another at least twenty dollars if you're getting any kind of refreshments and then the last movie that i saw in cinemas was spider-man and you better believe that the lady in the row in front of us was scrolling on amazon the entire time like people treat the cinema like their living room Mm -hmm. i would rather hang out in my living room where i can pause and go to the bathroom (laughs) now i still love movie theaters and i love going to the movies but i i don't have to not go you know, you're yep. not saying put them on streaming and and t- get rid of theaters. Yeah, uh, yeah, yeah. I I I I think I'm I'm fall on uh, close to rock. I think the 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 it is a really good point specifically for kids about what and also you don't want to be truth truth be told you don't want to be taking your kids to the theater like if they're under like specifically if they're like under 10 it's like well that's a dicey proposition um but uh but (laughs) right now under five not a single kid is vaxxed you know yeah so yeah yeah, even dicier than before even dicier than before but um and and the idea of making it accessible to everybody and having that experience although i specifically i also like going to the, like i i we went yeah. to our screening for the batman and then i went again to the theaters sunday morning um uh, also to ashley's point though i usually go like sunday matinee so i'm not i'm oh, not, yeah, I'm, or, yeah, I'm or not tuesday <laughs> evenings yeah yeah yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. I'm, I'm not yeah. I'm, I'm uh i'm not i'm not paying those full ticket prices no thanks no. um <laughs> anyway the, the thing that like oh sorry no 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 say what you're gonna say The thing that really convinced me, um, it was like a few months ago and I kind of was still more on the put things in theaters, don't do the streaming, takes away the experience, yada, yada, yada conversation. The thing that really convinced me is a lot of my handy capable friends were like, it sucks for us that we can't see movies for months later because we can't make it to the movie theater 
And and there's no way for us to watch it at the same time other people mm-hmm. watch it. And it's just not a very inclusive environment that we're saying that anybody in this time period who might be a little more immune compromised or anybody who is handicapped, who might not be able to get the care or access to theaters or anything that you guys, you have to wait. It's not because you can't, it's not because you don't have money and you can't pay for the movie. It's because Mm -hmm. we don't want to provide a service for you guys that allows you to experience things in the same time as other people. Um, And I think that sucks. I agree. And, and especially because even in Los Angeles where we all live, which I think probably has more cinemas per capita than maybe anywhere else. Like think about people who are hard of hearing or deaf. Like it's hard to find like a a subtitled, a closed captioned screening here too. So yeah. yeah, totally. We'll yeah. pay for it. People will pay for convenience. Yeah. Come on. <laughs> Come on. All right. Those are our thoughts on Turning Red. Those are our thoughts on Obi-Wan. Ashley, before we go, remind the kids at home where they can find Aurora and the Eagle. Yes, you can find my what is now a pre-order campaign for Aurora and the Eagle, number one remix, 48 pages in its full glory at auroraandtheeagle.com. Uh, honestly, if you type in Aurora and the Eagle anywhere, it will pop up. I'm good that SEO, but you can also find the direct <laughs> link. Uh, go ahead and support it. I would be very, very grateful. You can say nasty things about it as long as you support it. I don't care. Uh, and if this one goes well, then we might be able to turn around and do a new issue before next year, which which is my which would be my dream. So That'd anyone amazing. who comes over and supports it, thank you, thank you, thank you so much. Please go check that out. Roxy, before we go, remind the kids at home where they can find you. Everywhere at Roxy Stryer. And you can find me at DJ Talks Trash. You can follow this show everywhere that matters at Only Stupid Answers, but on Twitter. Yank out the vowels from stupid. That is it for us, and we'll see you all next week. Uh, Bye, everybody.